All right, we are in Ecclesiastes. So I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, if you don't know where that is, if you can find Psalms, which is like the biggest book in the Bible in the middle, you'll be able to find Ecclesiastes. It's going to be after Psalms. So Ecclesiastes um, 12 is where we're going to be. We've been studying Ecclesiastes since this summer, and today we're going to close it out down. Today we're going to kind of look at the end of Ecclesiastes and try to bring together what God's been telling us um, through the book of Ecclesiastes about what life is about. Ecclesiastes is a book of wisdom and literature from God that is telling us what life is about. And many people think that lives about, our lives are about certain things, and what Ecclesiastes is about is a man who said, hey, I pursued that. You know what I found out? Life isn't about that. He, Solomon is the one who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and he's the one who basically goes before us and says, hey, don't waste your time. I tried that one. Everybody told me life was about it. I pursued it, and you know what I found out? It's lacking. His word in Ecclesiastes is it's meaningless. And so basically what we have with this uh, book from God is a book that tells us don't waste your time pursuing this in life. Don't waste your time pursuing that in life. It's not what it's about. And there's several different things he tells us through Ecclesiastes that don't waste your time with. He tells us not to waste our time pursuing money. Life isn't really about it. You need it. You can enjoy it. But it isn't about it. It says, don't waste your time pursuing education. Sorry, college students. <laughs> don't waste your life pursuing education. It's, it's good. It's needed. It's helpful. But life isn't actually about it. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. Ecclesiastes tells us not to pursue generosity. It's good. It's helpful. It's kind of God's heart. But life isn't just about generosity for being generous, um, just for generous sake. It's not the point. And what happens is that many things in life are good things, and many things in life are things that God has created and given us, but they're things that can distract us from God. And when we make the things that God created more important than God himself, and we begin to pursue the created things rather than the creator, we're off. And this is what Ecclesiastes is about. It's a, it's a heart check. It's a heart check to say, hey, are you pursuing the creator or are you pursuing the created thing? Are you pursuing the one who gives you all the resources or are you pursuing the resources that he gives? Are you the one who's pursuing all kinds of knowledge or are you the one who's pursuing the one who knows how all things fit together? What are you pursuing? And it's just a heart check to make sure that we're making the main thing the main thing. And all the things he talks about, they're not bad. It's just don't pursue them in the absence of God. So you'll, you'll see that Ecclesiastes, a lot of these things, like money is a good thing. And we spent a couple weeks saying, hey, God says this about money. Enjoy it. I gave it to you. You can actually just enjoy the fact that you have it. You can buy things that you enjoy. And at the same time, maybe you should be generous also. He, he brings these caveats. Like it's something that's good. But it can be twisted and become the great pursuit. And once it becomes the great pursuit, you're off. And Solomon said, when I looked at life, I had everybody telling me the great pursuit was money. And I found, once I got all of it, it was meaningless. And I was told it was all about everything, knowledge and wisdom. And so I pursued it. And I, I became wise and I, pursued, I got knowledge. And I found once I had it, I'm like, my life still feels meaningless. And all these different things. That, that's what it says. So Ecclesiastes 12 is where we start to see the end of this letter. And there's a couple things that he wants to draw our attention to as um, we come to a close. In chapter 12, verse 1, here's how he wants us to hold on to this truth. Remember. That's the key word. Remember. Remember. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come when the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop. When the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim. When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades. When men rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. When men are afraid of heights and have dangers in the streets. When the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along 
and desire is no longer stirred. Then man goes to his eternal home, and mourners go about the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is severed, or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring, or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Skipping ahead, verse 13. It was the conclusion of the matter. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Follow, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it's good or evil. There's, there's a lot there, and there's lots of different phrases that are there, but let me just distill it down. Um, because here's what he really said. He says, remember me. Remember God. Remember God in your youth before all kinds of troubles hit. Now, here's the thing I love about college students for the most part. I mean, it's not true of every college student, but for the most part, the world's before you, and everything is awesome. You, you can't wait for the next day to happen. You can't wait to get ahead. You can't wait to graduate. You can't wait to um, start to get your job. Like, you're like, the world is your ocean, and it's all before you. Now, some of us have started into that, and a little farther down the road, we're like, oh, okay, well... Um, not everything's before me anymore. Like, I, when I was 40, I said I was cresting. I wasn't over the hill, I was cresting. Um, but, you know, now I'm over that, and so I, I can't no longer say I'm not cresting anymore. But now things are, are starting to, you know, be on the back side of things, right? And then there's, there's other of us who are, are maybe even nearer um, to the end of life here. And what he's saying is, remember. He says to the youth, remember me before trouble comes. Now's the time to remember. And what you want to do is you want to put in place the way to remember me and not forget me. Because before you, as your life begins to take off, you're going to begin to pursue things. Don't forget me. Remember me. You're going to begin to pursue a job. You're going to begin to pursue a career. You're going to begin to pursue a mon money. You're going to begin to pursue money so you can get a house, you can get a car, so you can get this, you can get that. You're going to pursue marriage. You're going to pursue relationships. You're going to pursue families. You're going to pursue different things. And while you're young, before you start to pursue all these things, Put in place now, how are you going to make sure you remember the Lord? As you begin to pursue this, how are you going to make sure that you continue to remember the Lord uh, as the primary thing um, in all of your life? Because it's really easy to forget Him. It's very easy to forget Him. It's very easy for life to start. It's very easy for life to become busy. It's very easy for other things to creep in and become the pursuit instead of God. And it's very easy to forget for those of us who maybe the, the youth thing doesn't necessarily apply, the question is, have you forgotten or are you still remembering? Do not forget the Lord. And with it, are you remembering him? And he's just telling us time and time again, remember me. And all those different phrases are saying it this way. It's saying the same thing, just in different ways. Remember me because that will end. Remember me because that will fail. Remember me because that will... Um, not see its way all the way through in your life. Remember me before trouble comes. Remember me before that happens. Remember me before this disaster comes. But remember me. Remember me when things go well. Remember me when you're prospering. Remember me when you're happy and you're joyful and you're experiencing fullness of life. Remember me. Just make sure you're remembering me. This is what he wants us to do. Um, as I started to think about it, he's just saying, uh, remember me because really, what Ecclesiastes is all about is there is one great equalizer. There, there are people in this room that have very different experiences in life. There are some in this room that are honestly have very good salaries and are quite rich. And there's others in the room that are um, struggling just to even get a job. And there's everyone in between. There are people in this room that have um, the fullness of life with family and children and all that. And there's others without. There's all kinds of things around the room. There's differences uh, around the room of different things that people have and don't have. But there is one great equalizer. We all die. That's what Ecclesiastes is saying. We all die. We all die. And if you don't think about life through the lens that we all die, you will pursue the wrong thing. If you and I think that life is just about here and it's just about uh, pursuit of money, pursuit of education, pursuit of this or pursuit of that, you'll miss it. You have to put it through the backdrop of eternity. You have to do it through the backdrop of not just that we all die. Because that's not exactly what Ecclesiastes says. It actually is saying, for we all die, 
and we will all face our God one day. It's not just that it's all going to end. It's that you will give an account of how you chose to live the life that God gave you. That's how Ecclesiastes actually ends when he says we all will give an account. So it's not just that you're going to die, though it's the great equalizer. And so we will all face him and give an account. What did we do with the things that God gave us? The good and the bad. As I started to ponder this and I started to think through, like how, how does this really speak to Ecclesiastes as a whole, um, it made me go down several different rows. Remember God. Remember God when you're in business. If you forget God when you're pursuing business, you'll think life is all about money, jobs, promotion, and titles. That's what you think it's about. And it's meaningless. Remember, that's our word that happens in Ecclesiastes. It's meaningless when you consider it against the backdrop of eternity. It's meaningless when you see God face to face and say, here's my life. Here's what I did with it. I made this much money. Imagine that. You're seeing God face to face. You're at the end of your life. You're face to face. And God's saying, so what would you do with your life? And you're like, hey, let me tell you. This is what I did with it. I made a million dollars. Uh, okay. I, I like Bruce's response. Like, I mean, imagine that. Oh, here, let me tell you what I did with it. I got this really big house. It was really cool. I, I got this job promotion. I was pursuing it forever. And I got it. I, I got my promotion. He's just like, Okay. If you pursue this instead of the Lord, then you'll have a certain answer. Now, if you pursue the Lord and you still have a business, that's a great thing. So you can pursue the Lord and have business. You can pursue the Lord and have money. You can pursue the Lord and have education. You can pursue the Lord and have it. But then you show up and go, hey, God, here's the deal. You gave me so many opportunities. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for um, the job that I got, and thank you for giving me the education I have. Thank you for giving me the mind that you gave me so I could go and do all those things. I actually really enjoyed the way you made me, and I enjoyed that. And you know what? I really enjoyed the, the house I was able to get. I was able to enjoy the promotion that I got. But the reality is, what I really mostly enjoyed, you were in all of it. And I enjoyed my relationship with you through all of it. And there were times when I had fears, and I wasn't sure where money was going to come. And I cried out to you, and you showed up. There was a time when I got that promotion. I didn't even know if I was going to get it. And so I'm crying out to you and saying, God, would you please help me? Could I, I really want this job. Can you help me with that? And you know what? You did that for me. And you know what? There was another time where um, I, was, I was putting up money, a uh, uh, contract on a house. Thinking of a realtor over here when we talk about the house. I put an offer on a house. And you know what? I didn't get the one I wanted. True story. We didn't get the house we wanted. We put an offer on a house and they said no, even though we had the best offer. And even though everyone told us we had the best offer. They said no. And the good news is, is that we're praying about it, and God says, that's a joke. I got one way better for you. It's right down the street here in Franklin Farm, which we didn't even think we could afford. So in that, it's like, I'm not going to be telling you, God, God, I got this out. I'm going to be saying, God, I can't believe this. We were praying, and we were seeking you, and you got us something better than we ever imagined, something we didn't even think about. I just enjoyed the fact that you were in it. So when I show up and I see him face to face, it's more about my relationship with him than this. Do you see the difference? But one is that if you show up and your whole pursuit in life is just about these things, then you'll show up and say, God, this is what I did with my life. But if the pursuit is the Lord, what you will say is very different. And it will be all about how you and God interacted throughout life, through a job, through um, a salary, through a raise, um, through a big house, any number of things. Where's your pursuit? The Lord or this? It's not about education. Ecclesiastes tells us several times in several different sections of Ecclesiastes. It's not about that. See, it's not about education. It's not about what you know. But who you know, or rather, who you're known by. That's what it's about. It's, it's like, it, at the end of the day, you're not going to show up to facing God and saying, here's the deal. I could fathom all these things, and I figured out all this stuff, and I did this, and I cured that, and I solved this, and I, like, I solved that crime. Right? Here you are going to criminal justice. I healed this person going into nursing. Like it's just, it's not about that. Right? But rather, it's going to be in those spots where you're in a situation, you're trying to solve a crime, and going, God, I don't know who did this. And I don't know what all of these facts are telling me. And I don't know what all this evidence is saying. Can you guide my thoughts? Can you guide my process so I can see it and so I can discover it? And then you've experienced God as a revealer. 
And then what happens, you show up to him and you see him face to face and you go, God, you're a revealer. I, I can't believe that. I, I loved my job, but I loved more that I got to do it with you. And I loved my experience with you in that. Or I'm a nurse, and I, I love the fact that we go in and together we were helping people who were very sick, and I didn't know what medicine they needed. I didn't know what was the right thing to do in that moment. I wasn't sure about this. And I took a moment, I prayed, and I listened to you, and you told me exactly what to do. And you show up face to face and going, I love the relationship we had in it. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. Or rather, who knows you. And why I say that is found in Luke. I'm not want to drive this point home, so turn with me to Luke. Luke's going to be in the New Testament. If you can find Matthew, Mark, then Luke. We're going to look at Luke 13. We're going to start in verse 22, I think. Okay, we all there? Luke 13, 22. Listen to this. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? And he said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and the first who will be last. It's a hard passage. Let's uh, break it down for a second. Keeping it in this backdrop, it's not, about, it's not about what you know. It's about who you know or rather, who knows you? So here's the situation. Let's just unpack this story for a second. Jesus is walking along, and he's doing what he does. He's just with people. He's out and about. And then a guy comes up to him. He's walking with him. A guy walking with him asks Jesus a question. Here is his question. Will only a few be saved? Now, let's paint the scene for a second. You've got to picture this in your head. Jesus is walking along. He's got other people around him. He is kind of walking and teaching at the same time. He's in a group of people. And then one guy walking with him says, Hey, will only a few be saved? Now, if you're the guy who asked the question, I want you to put yourself in his shoes for a second. You're the guy who asked the question. If you ask the question, will only a few be saved? What response do you think Jesus might give you? It's rhetorical. Just give me a second to think about it. What response do you think Jesus might give you if you ask that question? I'm guessing, if I was that man, that I'd, want, I'd expect one of a few responses. He might tell me, no, dude, everybody's getting in. He might also say, it's sad, but yeah, only a few. That's what I, what I would think he would say. I've asked him a question, will only a few be saved? Is it like a yes or no question, or it's like, yeah, that's many and not that many. Like, that's what I think he'd say. But it's not what he said. Instead, he answered the question this way. He says, look, the time is coming when the owner of the house is going to get up and close the door. Meaning, the door is open right now. Anybody can come in that wants to. But there's a time coming when the owner of the house will get up and close the door. And when that day comes, you will be on the outside looking in. Does that strike you as odd? The man who asked the question said, will only a few be saved. And Jesus' answer is saying, hey, buddy, the reality is you're not saved. You're going to be on the outside looking in, though you're walking with me. In fact, here's something you're going to say to me one day. When you see me face to face, you're going to say this to me. But we walked with you. We ate with you. You taught in our streets. We were with you all the time. And, and there's another section where very similar. It's like, we cast out demons. We did this thing. And Jesus says the same thing in both the Matthew passage and Luke passage. like, doesn't really matter. I never knew you. And he's telling this man, you who are walking with me, you who are all around me, you who think you know because you're hearing me teach, you're on the outside looking in. On top of that, you're going to be outside looking in, and here's something you're going to see. You're going to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob on the inside, but you'll be on the outside. Translation, you're going to look in, and you're going to see people you recognize. You're going to see people that you know and people you recognize, but you will be on the outside. 
Then on top of it, he says, um, then on top of it, other people will get in that you never thought could. And you think don't deserve it. Because you're missing it. There are people whose lives don't look like you expect them to look, but they know me. Other places, Jesus says this, you'll find the prostitutes and the tax collectors getting in before you find the really religious people getting in. Because they know me, and I know them. And so what he's saying is, you need to be known by God in order to be inside the door. Because there's a day coming, say, saying the same thing Ecclesiastes is, there's a day coming when the door is going to shut to your life. And when that door shuts, you want to know if you can be on the inside of that door or if you're going to be on the outside of that door. And the way that you know has nothing to do uh, with doing necessarily the right thing or being super religious. It's about knowing him and rather him knowing you. God wants to be able to say, Rick, I know you. Now that's a strange thing to say that really what God wants to do is be able to say he knows me. It, it, did you see that? It says, away from me, I never knew you. It doesn't say, away from me, you didn't know me. It says, away from me, I never knew you. That word knew is a very important word. It's, it's about intimacy. In fact, you'll find a word knew in uh, many places in the Bible, and oftentimes we'll describe a husband and wife, that Jacob knew his wife, or Abraham knew Sarah. That word knew, intimacy. They know each other. What God's trying to say is, I want to know you. That leaves us with this question, and it's a very important one. How? How are you known by God? Do you have a question? Prayer. Oh, okay. Answering. You're answering. It's Prayer. Mm -hmm. it yeah, works. it does work. And it works both ways. Not just to learn about him, but also for him to know you. Right? How are you known by God? Um, we'll come back to that. All right, I didn't put it up there for that. So I'm going to tell you, how are you known by God? How are you known by God? Let's take your example of prayer. Let's take some of the examples I've already given you. There are times in your life where you're going to have hard seasons. In fact, Ecclesiastes says there's a season for everything. There's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry. There's a time to dance and there's a time to mourn. There's a time... Um, all, I'm just saying, it's Ecclesiastes 3 if you know that song. There's a time, right? Turn, 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 right? There's a time. There's a season for everything. What God's trying to tell you about being known is experiencing God in the seasons that you're in. If you want to be known by God, you have to, we'll take your word prayer, interact with God in a way that he knows you and what you're thinking and feeling as you go through these different things. And inviting God into your life in these different seasons. It's what I would kind of describe like when we're talking about him solving crimes. I'm inviting you in. I don't know what to do with this. And what God's going to say, man, I know Marlon. We've hung out. We did this together. We solved that crime, right? Like, it's one of those deals where it's like you involved me in it. Maybe you have a pain in your life. And Ecclesiastes talked about pain. We spent a, a couple of different uh, messages. We talked about inviting God into your pain, experiencing God as a God of compassion, that you want to be known by God. Talk to God about the pain that you have. Let him in. Let him experience you. Experience him through it. And as you do, what will happen is God's going to say, I know you. I knew, it. I knew you were hurting then. We talked about it. I want to be known by you, and I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you. See, that's the key, is that God desires a relationship. He doesn't desire perfect people. Rather, he desires a relationship with people just as they are. That's what he wants. He wants a relationship. How are you known by God? You know, there's going to be times when you might be reading Scripture, and it might hit you in a certain way, and you might, um, sometimes you might not agree with what you're reading. Because you might have God speak to you about a certain area of life, and it might not be the way you're living. And it might actually uh, speak against the way you're living. And you know what? If you're known by God, what you do is you actually talk to him about how you're feeling about it. If you're going to be known by him, it's like, don't be afraid to say, hey, I'm not sure I agree with that. Or, I don't really like that. I, want, I don't want to give that up. I enjoy this. Let him in. Let him in. Now, here's what happens when you let him in. 
He's going to begin to talk to you about it, and he might actually bring you to a place where you're willing to give it up. But it's a process, and it's not a thing, look what I did for God. Rather, it's what do you and the Lord do together in relationship where the Holy Spirit of God, who begins to convict and begins to transform and begins to renew your mind and begins to make you more like him because he is the one who made you. And you bring him into that. Just be real, open, honest. You treat him like you would treat a normal friend. And as you do, he will know you. And don't be afraid to talk to God about what's going on in here. There are times where you're just going to be rejoicing. There'll be times when you'll be thankful. There'll be times when you just can't contain yourself because of what your God did. Talk to him about all of it. Experience him. You'll be known by him. Now, it's true there is a gospel, and the gospel is this. I want to make sure nobody misses it. The Bible does say this. All of us have sinned. All of us have sinned. And all of us fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. There isn't a person in the world who doesn't. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible also tells us that the consequences of sin is death or a broken relationship with God and a relationship is ceased to exist because of sin. All have sinned and none have a relationship with God. How do you fix that? How do you fix that problem? Do you fix that problem by just trying to be good and saying, hey God, look what I did? doesn't work. He's already determined that you fall short of his glory and every good work you do, it, he says it's a filthy rag. It doesn't work. What God says is, you can't fix your problem, but I can. God says, yeah, I know you can't fix it. I know that you're hopeless and without power to fix this. So that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to die on a cross and pay the penalty for us that we couldn't pay for ourselves. And anyone who placed their faith in him and their hope that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave conquering our sin need, that person's saved. But more than just the little acknowledgement that Jesus died on the cross for us, it's the, you died on the cross for me and I'm inviting you into my life. It's not a simple prayer that saves you. Rather, it's the invitation of God into your life to say, God, I surrender. Thank you for dying for me. I place my faith in that. Now come into my life. I want to walk with you. And you experience God on a daily basis. Why do we do a hearing God class? Because we believe that's where you're supposed to live every single day of your life. We believe that you're supposed to experience the voice of God in your life every day. Why? Because God wants to know you. And he also wants you to know him. He wants to have a deep, rich, personal, intimate relationship with you. He wants you to know his voice inside and out so that you are walking with him and every decision you make is because you're walking with him. If you know his voice, then you can live out Ecclesiastes. If you don't know his voice, you're going to miss the richness of spiritual life. The richness of spiritual life is to know when the Lord is with you and when he is communicating to you and walking with him. It's not about what you know. It's about who knows you. And it's about who you know experience him and let him in so you're known by him. You ever had a friend who you're like, your acquaintances? You might know things about them. You might know lots of things about them. But the reality is your relationship is really shallow because you really know nothing about them. Because you don't really know what goes on in their heart. They're always keeping you at a distance. They're always telling you like little things just kind of keep you out there, but they don't let you in. This is what God's saying. Don't treat me like that. Let me in. He loves you this much. He died for you. He knows everything in your heart anyway. He doesn't think it's ugly and a mess. He thinks it's something he died for and can fix. He wants to come in right where you are, no matter how dirty or messed up you think it is. God's saying, I want to know you, and I can handle it. And there is nothing that I can't handle. Just come, do life with me. And that's why he says, I tell you, you know who's coming in? It's the prostitutes. It's the tax collectors. You know why? Because they're willing to be honest with me and say, hey, this is my life. This is where I'm at. I need you. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to try and get your life all together so you can go see God. No, you just come to God where you are and experience God in the place that you're in. And you and him will make it through life and you'll see him face to face and you're going to say, hey, it's so good to see you. We've been hanging out for quite some time. And this is what you look like. See, this side of heaven, all we get to do is to see God through the lens of faith. One day we'll see him face to face. And one day what's going to happen is we're going to say, oh, 
that's who you are? It will be an exciting time. There are two judgment seats in Scripture. And because Ecclesiastes talks about the fact you'll give an account, I want you to know about two seats in Scripture, two judgment seats that appear in Scripture. The first judgment seat is found in Revelation. It's called the White Throne of Judgment. Let me tell you what the White Throne of Judgment is. The White Throne of Judgment is found in Revelation. It's where God separates people that know him and people that don't. It's where he separates the sheep and the goats. It's where, you'll find that in Matthew 25. Other descriptions are, it's where he just basically comes and he says, look, did you know me? Or did I know you? If I know you and you know me, we're good. Come on in. Come and receive everything I prepared for you. If you don't know me and you pursued everything else in life but not me, and I don't know you and you don't know me, if you decide to leave me out of life, well, why would you want me now anyway? So I don't have anything for you because I don't know you. You get to enjoy whatever it is that's out there that's devoid of me. That's really what hell is, the absence of God. And when you take the absence of God out, you take all goodness out, and you take all love out, you don't want to be there. One day the door will shut. The white throne of judgment separates the people that know God from the people that don't. The people that know that Jesus died on the cross from, from the people that don't. Why do we go tell people about Jesus? Because one day that door shut, and we want to make sure everybody knows before that door shuts. It's really important. Because one day it will. Now the other thing is there's another throne of judgment. It's in Scripture. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It is called uh, the judgment seat of Christ. This seat has a Greek word with it. It's really important to know the Greek word. It's bema. It's also called the bema seat. The judgment throne of Christ is called the bema seat. Here's why you need to know it's Greek and why, why it's important and why bema is important. Bema is a Greek word. It is used to describe a judgment seat at the Olympics. So it's used in some other places too. But the Greeks had the Olympics. They're the first people of the Olympics. They had a judgment seat. It is a judgment seat of reward. This is what it is. It's not where you're judged and you're punitively given like um, corrective things at this seat. The white throne of ju uh, uh, judgment in Revelation is the one where you're separated, right? The white, uh, the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ is where every believer goes before God and God rewards you for the things you've done with your life. You're already in and now he rewards you with the things that you've done. Now here's how he's going to do that. He's going to reward you based on the motive of why you did what you did. And it might be that he's going to say, hey, you know what? You made a ton of money. And you know what you did with it? You were generous and kind. And you, you gave it away here and you gave it away there. And you did with, this with it and that with it. You helped out the poor. You helped out this person. You, like, you were kind and you were generous. And you know what? Very few people even know about it. You were so humble about it. It wasn't about you. Come receive the reward I have to give you. I saw your heart. It was so pure. It was amazing. Thank you for that. Then anyway, I might say something like this. Now, this other thing over there, I know you thought you were doing that with good intentions, but the reality is we both know it. your motive was more pride-oriented. There's just no reward in it. I mean, I, I get it. It was a good thing, but I, I, it wasn't for the right thing. I'm, I'm not rewarding it. You're still in. We're still close. I still got you. We're pals and all that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm not rewarding that part. He's going to basically give us a time where he rewards us for the things that we did with our lives and looking and going, these are the things that God gave me. He gave me a mind. How did I use it? He gave me a body. How did I use it? He's given me some resources financially. How did I use them? He's given me different things. How did I use them? This is what you and I are going to stand before the Lord about. If you already know the Lord, you're going to get rewarded for the things that you did with him that he knows are of pure motive. And it's a place of reward. It's not punitive. It's not condemning. It's just saying, hey, let's just talk about the good things we did together. When you are known by God, you will do things with God. You'll do them together. When you're not known by God, you'll do them on your own. When you do them on your own, you'll show up. You're like, look what I did. He's like, what's the point? We didn't do it together. God is a God of a group project. You and him. Not an individual project. It's not where you show up and say, hey, look what I did. No, it's look what we did together. God wants to know you. And God's saying all through Ecclesiastes, remember me. We don't have time to really unpack too much more today, and I don't know if I'll have time later to hit it, but God um, wants to reward us. And um, with that, when he rewards us, he rewards us based on things that are done with right motives. So he really wants us to be generous. How are you rich towards God? That's really where the question's coming from. How are you rich towards God? He wants us to be generous. If you're generous, you're rich towards God. 
He wants us to be gracious with your words. Remember that from Ecclesiastes? You're rich towards God when you're gracious with your words. Um, don't be so generous you go broke. The whole point isn't just to take all your money and give it all away. The point is also to take the resources and enjoy it because God gave you something he wanted you to enjoy too. Be generous, but as Ecclesiastes says, there's balance. Enjoy the life God gives you. In all of life, remember God. Thank him, praise him, rely on him, live like him, rejoice in him, mourn with him, do your part, let God do his part. That's what it means to start to, and I wish I could unpack that more, but I'm going to take two minutes to do it, but um, thank him. Anytime something happens, it's because he gave it to you. Take some time to thank him. And you'll know him. He'll know you. Praise him. I think you get that. Rely on him. That, that one we've, we've talked about a few times here is like rely on him. Rely on him in your job. Rely on him in your parenting. Rely on him in your relationships. Rely on him. And as you're relying on him, you'll be known by him, and he'll know you. Live like him. It's like, hey, this is who you are. I want to live like you. It just The more you get to spend time with him, the more you'll find out this is who he is. And when you know who he is, it'll affect the way you live. We, we like to say it this way. When you know who he is, you will know who you are. When you know who you are, it's going to affect the way you live. Know who he is, you'll know who you are. When you know who you are, it'll affect the way you live. Now here's the deal, catch this. When it affects the way that you live, then people around you will know who you are. And when they know who you are, they will know who he is. That also is a very great way to share Jesus with people. First starts here. Know who he is. He'll tell you who you are. Once it tells you who you are, it'll affect the way you live. Then just live your life that way. As you do, then people will find out who you really are. And in turn, they'll find out who he is. Rely on him. Live like him. Rejoice in him. Mourn with him. When you're having a hard time, weep with him. When you're having a hard time, uh, let him know what's gut-wrenching. Let him know. Let him in. And do your part. Let God do his part. There's several passages in Ecclesiastes that basically say, you don't know what disaster is going to come, so uh, spread the wealth of your investments and invest in seven or eight things because you don't know what's going to happen. The other thing it tells us is get up in the morning and do your job and do it throughout the day and let God take care of what he's supposed to take care of. We have responsibility. As we do our responsibility, then let God fill in those gaps as we're responsible. But you'll know him and involve God in your part. As you're doing life, make sure you're involving him. He wants to know you. And he wants uh, you to know him. Ecclesiastes is, in a nutshell, these things are good. I made them all. Don't leave me out of it. If you do, you'll miss it. And your life, in the end, will be meaningless. But if you pursue me in all of it, then there'll be times when you have plenty. There'll be times when you have little. There'll be times when you have what you need. But you'll have me in all of it. There will be seasons in your life that are going to be up and they're going to be down. There will be times when you will laugh and there will be times when you cry. There will be times when you're rejoicing and there will be times when you're mourning. There will be times when things are going well and every dream you have is being fulfilled. There will be times where everything you're asking for is crashing around you. There will be times in your life that are going to be up and down and that's the way life is. And you can't escape it. And it doesn't matter if you know God or not, you can't escape that. What does matter is that God is in all of those things in our lives. Let him know you. And if you get that, I think you understand Ecclesiastes. Thanks for giving me a couple of extra minutes. Um, rise to your feet. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know and who knows you. Maybe you don't know Jesus yet. Maybe you heard for the first time that God says we all fall short of the glory of God. Maybe you heard for the first time that the cost of our sin is death and eternal separation from God. The good news is God said, I'll solve that problem for you. Maybe that's the first time you heard that God would solve it and you don't have to. Maybe you've heard that before, but it now makes sense in a different way. If you have never placed your faith or your hope in Jesus and the fact that he died on the cross for you, we just want to give you a chance to um, acknowledge to God you need him. It's not the prayer that saves you. No, it's more about inviting God into your life. That's what saves you. It's about a relationship. So we're just going to give you an opportunity to do that. So every eye closed, I'm going to walk us through it. Jesus, if, if this is you, you might say something like this to God. God, I realize that I've got sin in my life. And I realize I fall short of your glory. But you might also say something like this. But God, I thank you. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross for me. Thank you that you love me just as I am. Thank you that I don't have to clean myself up. 
Thank you that you um, want me still just in this state. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. I place my hope and my faith in him. And I invite you into my life. I want to be known by you. And I want to know you. Please guide me and be with me in my life. May the Lord watch over us all. May he draw us close to him. And may he grow our relationship with him. May he open up our ears that we would hear him. May he make our hearts soft and sensitive to him. May we experience him in our highs and our lows and everything in between. And may we know that God is the God that we sang about earlier today. He's Emmanuel, God with us. And we thank you that you're a personal God. We thank you that you are with us and that you desire to make our hearts your home. And so we just ask you to continue to draw us close to you and help us to realize more and more what it means to know you and to be known by you. In Jesus' name, amen.